All right, it's good to see you here this morning, and yes, it is weird watching myself on video. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5, and we're continuing a sermon series that we began at the beginning of the year where we're, dealing, we're looking at our four B's. Now, if you've been around here any time at all, you know we have four B's. We say as a church, we want to help people what? Believe, oh, that was weak. Come on. We want to help people what? Believe in God, belong to his family, become a 5W disciple, and live beyond themselves. And so we started the year off by looking at that believe. And we said, you know, when we talk about believe, yes, it is about believing in God for salvation. But it's much more than that. The real question is, after we believe in God for salvation, do we believe God? Do we trust him every day when his word gives us a promise? Do we believe that promise and walk in obedience to it? And, and so the, we looked at believe. Then we looked at belong. And we talked about that belonging was much, much more than joining a church. Belonging really was being a part of the team. Belonging was being on mission together uh, to do what God has commissioned and called us to do. Then last week, Marcio talked about becoming a 5W disciple, that, um, <clears throat> that God doesn't want us to be infants in Christ. He wants us to mature and grow in Christ's likeness. In fact, the writer of Hebrews said this. He said, you know, when he wrote the book of Hebrews, he said, I would love to give you spiritual meat, but because you're still babes in Christ, because you have not grown spiritually, all I can give you is spiritual milk. And, and here's the thing. We don't want people who've been believers for a long time to still be drinking spiritual milk. We want all that God has for us, and that's developing into a 5W disciple. And today we're going to look at our last B, and that is to live beyond yourself. It really is about living on mission. Now think about this. Here's our dream as a church. Our dream is that everyone who belongs to our church really lives beyond themselves and lives on mission. Now, what would happen if that happened in our church? Well, only God knows the full extent of what would happen, but here's what we know. In the book of Acts, 120 people committed themselves to live beyond themselves. 120 people said, God, we're available, and God, we want to live for you, and we want to live for your purposes. And that early church, on their first church service, had 3,000 people get saved. And, and they turned the world upside down because they determined that they were going to live for the mission uh, that God had created them for. Now, imagine if 120 people could make that kind of impact, what could the church do? today do if it really got serious about living on mission because here's what we need to know that calling of the 120 wasn't just for the early church it's for us too and and just imagine what it would look like if we lived that way we need to understand that as a church we don't exist just for for us we exist for god's glory and we exist to to represent God to the world. In fact, Jesus said this way, when you pray, pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How is God going to get his will done on earth? He's going to use his church to do that, to share the gospel with others, to be light, and to be representatives of Christ here where we are. And so that's why one of our five W's is that we're here to impact God's world. So if we're here to make a difference in our world, if we're here to impact God's world, let me ask you this. Have you looked at the world lately? The world needs the church. The world needs the light of Christ. Our world is dark and getting darker all the time. And that's where Paul, 2,000 years ago, was challenging the early Christians in Ephesus. And we're not going to read all of it, but if you were to start in verse 6 of chapter 5, here's what he's saying. He's saying, look, you're the light of the world. Now that you're in Christ, the light of Christ shines through you. Don't live as the people who are in darkness still live, but live as children of light. And then look at these two verses that are in your notes, 
15 and 16. He says, pay very careful, uh, pay careful attention then how you live. Not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. Understand what Paul is saying here. Pay attention how you live. Live uh, intentionally every day. Don't live as foolish or unwise people, but live as wise people. What does a wise person do? He makes the most of every opportunity. To do what? To let their light shine. Why? Man, because the days are evil. Now, if Paul said the days were evil 2,000 years ago, let me ask you, has it gotten any better? I mean, there's been times throughout history where nations have had revivals and we've seen amazing things happen, but, but globally, we would have to say that, um, that things really haven't got any better. And so, God, so Paul's challenge to the church at Ephesus is our challenge, and that is to make the most of, of um, every opportunity to let our light shine because the days are evil. In fact, things have gotten, we fluctuate in America, but things have gotten so bad that I keep getting these questions over and over. Um, uh, Chuck, are we living in the last days? Is this kind of the, you know, signs of the times? And are we living in the last days? Which my answer is, I really can't tell you. Jesus, when he was on earth, didn't even know, right, when the second coming was or if we were in the last days. But the Bible does talk about things that, that are going to occur before Christ comes back. And one of those is that the gospel will be preached to all the nations. And, and that word there is ethnos, that to all people groups, they'll have an opportunity to hear the gospel. And there are ministries all over the world, and we take global mission trips to, to share the gospel with as many people. But I think access to the gospel is available to about anybody in the world today. There are a few people groups where the Bible hasn't been translated into their language. But with, with uh, the internet, with all technology, it's probably available to most of the world. But, but here's another thing that Jesus said about what the end times would look like. And look at Matthew 24, 37. It says, as the days of Noah were, so the coming of the Son of Man will be. And so here's the closest indication of what Jesus said it's going to look like when he returns. It's going to look like the days of Noah. Which leads us to ask this question, what did the days of Noah look like? Well, in Genesis, it says that the Lord looked down on man's wickedness and how wicked they had become on the earth. And then he, it lists some of the things that were going on in the days of Noah. Now, the sins may not be exactly the same uh, the way they're carried out, but they're generally the same sins. There was sexual sin that was going on. There was pride and self-centeredness that was going on. There was idolatry that was going on. There was a disregard for God and for his authority over their lives. And we live in a culture today where many people just don't, uh, don't want to fall under the authority of God. And quite honestly, they don't, they don't believe the word of God anymore. In fact, I heard about a girl who wrote a paper in school about Jonah and the whale. And how Jonah was swallowed by the whale. And the teacher, um, when she got the report, she looked at the student dismissively and said to the girl, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard because this teacher didn't believe God's word. She told the, the little girl, it's physically impossible. There's no way that a man can live three days inside of the belly of a fish. And this girl wasn't going to back down from her teacher. And she just said, well, look, I believe it. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Jonah myself, how in the world that happened? And the teacher said, well, what if, what if Jonah didn't go to heaven? And the girl said, well, then you can ask him how it happened. <laughs> Look, here's the deal. The world's a mess. And God has a solution. And guess what? It's you. If you profess to be a follower of Christ, then you're the answer to the problem. Paul says, make the most of every opportunity to let your light shine because the days are evil. So as a church, we're going to do all we can to help people believe in God and then to believe God. To belong to his family because God's plan A is the church and he has no plan B. 
We want them to become spiritually mature because the more mature you are, the more God can use you. The more peace you'll have, the, the more power your prayers will have, the more mature you are. And then we want everyone to live beyond themselves. And so we pray, God, the world's in a mess, do something. And his response is, I, I really want to do something. And by the way, you're the answer, so get to work. And God has a purpose for every life in you. And it's through you that God wants to change the world. Look at this verse in Acts 13, 36. And, and this verse is a powerful verse for me. I've thought about this verse over and over. It says, for David, talking about King David, the man after God's own heart, not a perfect man, had all kind of faults, but ultimately wanted to serve God. It says, for David, after serving God's purpose in his own generation, fell asleep and was buried with his fathers. And I tell you what, I can't think of a better thing to put on my tombstone for Chuck. He served God's purpose in his own generation. And that should be the de desire of every believer. Put your name there. For me, that it can be said that I served God in my own generation. Uh, imagine what would happen if we served God's purposes here and then went to heaven. So the question is, how do you live beyond yourself? When we talk about living beyond yourself, how do you do that? Well, three things in your notes real quick. First of all, and this verse speaks to it, you, you, you serve God and live beyond yourself in your generation. But look at this other verse in Acts, Acts 26. Here's what it says. For one man he made every nationality to live over the whole earth, and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. And what we see is as we read God's word is that God has determined the times and places where you would be born and the impact that he wants you to make. Do you know that even before the foundations of the earth, God knew that you would be born. And, and God determined where you would be born and where you would live. You thought that your job brought you here. You thought you're here just because you were born here. And the truth is, there was something working behind the scenes on that. That God brought you here, and you keep reading that, and he said the purpose of that is so that men might seek him. You're not here by accident. And so as Christ followers, we need to stop complaining about what's going on in our nation, in our state, in our neighborhoods. And we need to take our calling seriously to be light in this generation. And instead of letting the culture change right in front of our eyes as we sit on the sideline, God calls for us, his church, to lovingly engage the culture and to be change makers. As your pastor, I am committed to preaching God's word. I'm not concerned about being politically correct. We're going to be biblically correct. But I'm going to do that, the scripture says, with gentleness and with love. And then we're to take that truth and we're to take the calling on our lives and we're to go and make a difference when we leave this place. Let me tell you. We need more people who are called to be Christian journalists and Christian newscasters. We need Christians on school boards and running for office. We need Christian businessmen and women who bring their beliefs and values to their businessmen, to their businesses. Look, the world can laugh and get mad at Chick-fil-A because of their stance on marriage and because they close on Sundays. But, when's the, but the last time I tried to get me a Chick-fil-A sandwich with no pickles at noon, there was a line around the building. God honors us if we will honor him. And, and that's one of the things our Work for Worship conference is about is, is to say that, that we are here in this generation. God has put you here to be salt and light 
to a dark world that's getting darker all the time, and you're the hope of the world. And as Christians, the more we can get in areas of influence and let our light shine, the more we can affect this generation. Obviously, the most powerful way that we can affect this generation is down on our knees and asking God to bring revival and to do a mighty work. But he also wants us not to shrink from an evil world, but to live in that evil world and expose the deeds of evil through the light of Christ. Paul says, making the most of every opportunity. So we live beyond ourselves in our generation. Secondly, we live beyond ourselves through those who are closest to us. The book of Acts tells a story of Paul and Silas getting arrested because they won't stop sharing the gospel. And they're sitting in prison after they'd been beaten and and they're in prison. They know they're going to face trial. and, And it says about midnight they were Worshiping, They were singing and praying at about midnight. And God sent an incredible earthquake that opened up all the doors to the prison. And the prison guard who was supposed to watch over these saw that all the doors were open. And his assumption was all the prisoners had run. And he's about to kill himself because he knows if he loses a prisoner, it's going to cost him his life. He'd much rather it happen quickly than the way the Romans would probably drag it out and kill him publicly and shame his family. And he's about to do that. And from the prison cell... A voice comes out and says, don't do that. We are all still here. All the prisoners were still there because um, Paul and Silas, apparently through their worship, had influenced the prisoners enough that they listened to Paul and Silas and they stayed there because they knew that if they left, it cost the prison guard his life. And on seeing that, the prison guard understood what an incredible act of grace this was. And look at verse uh, 30 and 31. He had heard Paul and Silas singing and worshiping and praying at night. And obviously, man, he knew why they were doing it and it had made an impact. And when he saw this act of grace that they had done, his first response is, sirs, what can I do to have what you have? Notice what he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Now, when he says you and your household, he's, this isn't a guarantee that if, you're, um, if you become a Christian, your household automatically becomes believers. But what he is saying here is that you, when you become a believer, now you become light in your household. You become the one who is, who is ministering to and sharing the gospel in your household And because of that influence, then hopefully your household will come to put their faith in Christ. You know, um, I've been amazed in the stories I've heard in the last several weeks of adult people who have come to know Christ and then led their parents to the Lord. Because our greatest mission field is those closest to us. And let me just share a statistic that shows how, how important this is. If both parents attend church on a regular basis, there's a 75% chance that your child will attend church when they grow up. There's no guarantee, but 75% chance that your children will attend church if both parents attend church. If dad attends church without mom, there's a 50% chance that the child will attend church when they become adults. If just mom attends, there's about a 15% chance that that child will attend church when they grow up. Dads, I hope you heard that. It drops from 50 to 15%. Look, God put an order to the family, and we can buck up against it, but it just holds true with everything we see. And by the way, if neither parent comes to church, there's only a 6% chance that that child will attend church when they grow up. And so our greatest mission field is our home and to live out our faith with our family. And it's an opportunity to impact those closest to us. And, And God is calling us to live beyond ourselves, first of all, in our home and with those that we, that we love. And so some of the questions that that I've challenged you with before, fathers, dads, let me ask you this. 
Are you more concerned with teaching your kid to throw a ball or teaching them how to pray? What kind of example are, are you setting in your home for how to love your wife so your child can see that? It's to live beyond ourselves and our homes. Moms, are you more concerned about getting your child to church as you are to getting them to dance practice? Are you praying for your family, family members who have never believed in God and looking for uh, opportunities to share your faith? We're to serve God and live beyond ourselves in our generation. Our primary mission field is those closest to us. And then secondly, we do it for God's glory. And look at this verse in 2 Chronicles 16, 9. And it says, For the eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth to show himself strong for those who are wholeheartedly devoted to him. Just think about that verse for a second. God is looking down and saying, I'm looking for a few people who are living beyond themselves, who are saying, God, I'm available. Like Isaiah, here am I, Lord, send me. God is looking for those kind of people. And what's he going to do? He's going to show himself strong through those people. You become a conduit of God's love. You become a conduit of God's grace. You become a conduit of God's mercy. And God uses you to make a difference in other people's lives. God is looking for people with a commitment to live for something bigger than themselves. And God wants you to make a difference in the world he's placed you in. As we get to this point, let me just pause and say thank you to all of those who are living beyond ourselves. Our church is growing. Uh, on a weekly basis, we're probably 200, 250 above what we were a year ago. And, and that wouldn't happen if it wasn't for so many people who are living beyond themselves. There are people who get here early and make sure the coffee is made and the coffee is hot. And aren't we appreciative of the coffee team? Amen? Right? Yeah, that's an applause one right there, right? We need caffeine in the morning. We've got a team who are taking care of our preschoolers today and talking to them about the love of Christ. We've got another team that are teaching our children and, and they're ministering to our children as we sit in our worship center. We have people, musicians, get here early and practice and they've practiced all week so that they can lead us in worship. We have those who greet us at the door. It, it takes a, an army of people on both of our campuses and all of our services to be able to be on mission, and God honors that. They really are making a difference. They're allowing us to come and to worship together. But if we really believe what God is calling us to do as a church, and that is to impact our mission field, our Jerusalem, our vision is that we want to have a campus within a 15-minute drive of everybody in our mission field. Now, why would we do that? Well, one of these reasons is because we want everybody to invite your neighbors because those closest to you include your neighbors. We want you to invite your neighbors to come to church. And if you live farther than 15 minutes away, it's harder to get your neighbors to come. We also know that this year there'll be somewhere between 4,000 and 6,000 churches closing their doors in America. But just to make that easy, 100 churches uh, this week will close their doors. And we need more churches to counteract those that are, have lost the vision and have no vision and, and are closing. Uh, we also know that new um, works reach people faster than established works. And to live beyond ourselves, we want to have a campus within a 15-minute drive of everyone in our mission field. That's probably somewhere between six and eight campuses. We have two right now. On Christmas weekend, we had 3,600 people show up, and that's just barely 1% of our mission field. And God is looking for those who are committed to him and his purposes. And the promise is he will show himself strong in them. 
but we need to be committed if he's going to use us to do what he's called us to do. And here's how Jesus said to handle this. Jesus said in Matthew 9, 37, he said, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. So he said, pray for more workers in the harvest. Let me tell you something that happens with our staff. All of us have our, our smartphone set to um, 9.35 in the morning because you can't set them to the minute, so we have to do 9.35 instead of 9.37. At 9.35, every day my smartphone shows a, a notice, and that notice is pray for workers. We can sit in staff meeting, 9.35, a whole bunch of phones go off, and we stop and it says, pray for workers. Because Jesus said, here's how you get people from the sidelines and engage them in the game. Pray and let me do the work. And so just know this, that every day we are praying for more workers, more people who will live beyond themselves so we can accomplish what God has called us to do. As we close, the question for all of us here today, do you believe in God? So come a point in your time when you, in your life where you know you've given your life to him and that you're saved. And then secondly, do you believe God? As you read his word, do you believe his promises? Do you, do you believe that the things he says to say no to will be destructive if we follow those paths and he wants the best for you? Do you believe he truly loves you? Do you belong? And I'm not talking about are you a church member? Are you involved in the mission that God has called us to? Are you becoming a disciple of Christ? Are you becoming more of that new person that God wants you to be and looking more like Christ on a, uh, on a regular basis? And then are you willing to live beyond yourself and discover your spiritual shape and let God use you? That's what our four B classes are for. If you've never joined the church or you've never really nailed down that that salvation experience you can join us next week at the belief class and each week after that we cover these four b's and here's my prayer that it can be said of all of us they served god's purpose in their own generation let's pray Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would speak to each one of us individually about the next step we need to take um, to be obedient to you and all that you've called us to do. And God, as a church, you've given us a great calling to, to make a difference in our generation, to live beyond ourselves and to make the most of every opportunity to let the light of Christ shine through us in a dark world. And that's going to look so, in so many ways different with so many people in the places you've put us, in our work, our neighborhoods, our school, our social groups, uh, the gym, wherever it is. And that, God, we would take your calling seriously so that one day it can be said of us that we served you and your purposes in our generation. And we do it for your glory and our eventual joy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.